We're going to be looking uh, at a, a wide swath of texts, but the text that we're going to start the sermon with is Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7. So turn to Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7. You can find this on page 74 of the Standard ESV Bible. Once you get to Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7, please stand for the reading of God's Word. Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 and 7. This is the Lord and Moses and their encounter on Mount Sinai. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. Let's pray together. Father, you appeared before Moses, and after he came down, his face was so bright and shining, having seen you, that he had to cover it with a veil. As we now dive into your word and learn more about your faithfulness, we pray that we would glow from an inward love and understanding of who you are and the way that you have blessed and loved us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, in 2021, we are doing an overview of Scripture. We're talking about the big overarching stories from beginning to end we're looking at Scripture as a whole. Because from Genesis 1-1 to the end of Revelation, this is one story with one theme. This is God's autobiography. This is the story of His glory. We've been using the four major themes of creation, fall, redemption, recreation. We've been pointing to this David Arms painting just as a visual representation of those four themes. As God created him, Adam and Eve in the garden, he walked with them. And then in Genesis 3, they fall and sin enters the world. We have loss. But right after the fall, God promises redemption. And he has been, he is, and he will continue to work that redemption out until one day, as we read in Revelation, we will walk once again with God in the garden and it will be even better than before. This study of Scripture is to help us see the significance and importance of every single point in the Bible. We so often treat the Scripture like an encyclopedia, pulling off and asking it one question and then putting that back, instead of seeing it as one big story, always pointing to God, always pointing to Christ. Christ is the hero of this story. Christ is the center <clears throat> of Scripture. And as we've said over and over again, it's not about you, it's about Christ. And as rough and as rude as it sometimes sounds, it is a relief. Because if it was about us, I don't know about you, but I would be failing miserably. And so thankfully, the scripture is about the one who can do all the things that we need done. That is the Lord. So as we continue this overview of scripture, we're not only seeing the ways that uh, scripture tells the same story throughout with Christ as a center, but we're also learning that we have to read Scripture well. And one of the key concepts that we've talked about is the concept of context. We need to understand what's going on around the text so that we can better understand the very words of the text. Because context is king. So this is the setup that we have for every sermon in 2021. It's this overview of Scripture. Now today, we're going to be looking at God's faithfulness. Faithfulness is not something that is highly valued in today's society. You can just look at the statistics for divorce and people living together. Faithfulness is not highly valued. And yet in Scripture, we see over and over again that it is a key concept and something that we can cling to, and that is God's faithfulness. God is faithful and calls us to be faithful as well. This faithfulness is important to him, 
And it's important to the way that we live, work, study, and play. So today, as we continue our overview, we're going to see God's faithfulness and our call to it. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at the setting, where we're at in Scripture. We're going to look at God's faithfulness, and then we're going to look at our call to faithfulness. The setting, God's faithfulness, and our call to faithfulness. So let's start with the setting We have already talked about how creation happened, how God called Abraham out, how Abraham's descendants were in Egypt for 400 years, how God brought them out of Egypt, redeemed them in a way that they could not redeem themselves, and now they're at the foot of Mount Sinai receiving the laws. And they sit at the foot of Mount Sinai from Exodus chapter 19 verse 1 all the way into Numbers chapter 10 verse 10. So just to remind us of where we've been, in the book of Exodus, here's a couple of the important things that we have covered or need to think about. The tabernacle. The tabernacle is really important to God. It is God's place. Tabernacle means God with us. Remember, we said in the New Testament, Jesus tabernacled with us. He was with us. That's what his name Emmanuel meant, God with us. We know the tabernacle is important because God spends so much time talking about it. How many chapters does God spend creating everything that is in existence? Two. How many chapters does he spend talking about the design and function and importance of his house? More than 11. He created all things, made every single thing that's in existence in two chapters, and spends more than 11 chapters telling us about his house and about what it means and how it relates to us. The tabernacle is really important to God, and it is his house, God with us. Then we saw the Ten Commandments given. We saw the golden calf, this idolatry brought out, even though they were told not to make images. We saw in chapter 24, the covenant confirmed We saw them being reminded of what the covenant was, even though they had been reminded already in Exodus 19. They are confirmed in the covenant in 34, and they're renewed in the covenant in chapter 34. Sorry, confirmed in 24, renewed in 34. This covenant renewal is important. As we continue through the Old Testament, we'll see this happen again and again. As the people have fallen away from God, They renew their covenant with him, making their promises again, being reminded that he's been faithful the whole time. And even though we're not in the the Old Testament anymore, every single time we gather here on Sunday, we are renewing the covenant with God. We're recognizing how over the course of the last week, we have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. This is our confession time. After God calls us to worship, after we praise him in song. We go through confession, being reminded of why we need God and how we are not enough. Then we get assured of who God is, his faithfulness, his character, his love. Then we go through and we see the gospel, this story of the covenant unfolded through different texts in scripture, how God brings forth his glory all throughout his story. And then we're sent out having been renewed in God's covenant to be little Christs in the world. Every single week when we gather, we're renewing God's promises with us. And this is important. He does this to his people every time they uh, sin against him and are getting ready to move forward. And he does this with us every single week. It's one of the reasons why corporate worship is so important because it's our opportunity to be renewed in our covenant with God. So from Exodus, we move into Leviticus. In Leviticus, we have a couple of major things. We see in chapters 1 through 7, the instructions on the offering. What does it mean to give an offering? What are the different types of offering? How do you give those offerings? What do those offerings mean? Chapters 8 through 10, we see God describe the priesthood. How do the people make atonement for their sins? How do they become back together with God after breaking apart from him with sin? Then we see the call to holiness in chapters 18 through 22, where again and again and again we're reminded of the ways that we have sinned and the ways that he calls us to be holy. And then we see in Leviticus uh, 26 the, the curses and the blessings of the law. 
And I want to read from Leviticus 26, verses 6 through 9, as God reminds them of the law, tells them of the blessings of obeying the law, and the cursings of disobeying the law. 26, 6 through 9 says this, I, that is God, will give peace in the land, and you shall lie down, and none shall make you afraid. And I will remove harmful beasts from the land, and the sword shall not go through your land. You shall chase your enemies, and they shall fall before you by the sword. Five of you shall chase a hundred, and a hundred of you shall chase ten thousand, and your enemies shall fall before you by the sword. I will turn to you and make you fruitful, and multiply you, and will confirm my covenant with you. So in Leviticus, God is reminding us again of the importance of the law and how keeping it brings us blessings and breaking it brings curses. And this is important, particularly as the people enter the land, as they go into the kings, and as we see them disobey God, we're going to come back to these blessings and cursings. So Leviticus has a lot more laws and things like that, but let's move on to Numbers. The Hebrew translation of the title for Numbers is actually in the wilderness, and that's a really apt description of what Numbers is. Numbers is the people wandering through the wilderness. After leaving Mount Sinai, they go into the wilderness, and we see what happens throughout the wilderness until they get to the foot of the promised land. We see a census being taken. We see marching instructions being given. What tribes march in what order? How do they surround the tabernacle as it's being carried? We see even how to clean the camp because it's important to God that his people are clean and pure. Remember he says, be holy because I am holy. Purity and holiness is important to God. So this is them sitting at Sinai. He's given those instructions to leave. And then they move from Sinai to the wilderness of Kadesh. We see this in Numbers chapter 10 verse, through chapter 12. And this includes three sets of protests. The people again and again and again are saying, well, I don't want to do that. Why don't we go back to Egypt? They're desiring to go back to slavery back to the known entity rather than trust in God. And this is a reminder to us because every time we sin, we are saying to God, I want to go back to the bondage that I was in in sin as opposed to trusting in you. Sin is hard. Sin is rampant. Sin is always around us. And every time we sin, we're turning away from God and doing the same thing that people did in running from him including protesting. In Numbers 13 through 19, we see the 40 years where they are near the wilderness of Kadesh. They've sent spies in, as we talked about already, one leader from every single tribe of the 12 tribes, and they come back and they say, oh, the land's magnificent. It's flowing with milk and honey. But by the way, there's giants in the land, so I don't think we should go in. Ten of them say this, don't go in. It's terrifying. There's giants. And two of them, Caleb and Joshua, say, no, God is going to give us this land. Look what he's done and look what he's going to do. But as with most majorities, the people listen to the 10 and say, we can't go in there. And so they have to wander around the desert for another 40 years. The people have rebelled and stopped trusting God. And in this wandering time, we get more law giving, we get more instructions on how to handle things uh, such as purity, etc. Then they move from Kadesh into the plains of Moab. They're getting ready to enter into the promised land, Numbers 20 through 36, or chapter 20 through 36. And again, more law giving. So at this point in the game, they are sitting at the doorstep to the land that God has promised them. We've seen God be faithful in bringing them out. We've seen the way that he's loved them. We've seen the way that he's provided for them. And we've seen again and again and again. They whine, they complain, they sin, they fall into idolatry. And God still loves and cares for them. When we enter into the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy functions as this reminder. They're sitting at the doorstep, ready to go in. Moses can't go in because of his sin. And so the book of Deuteronomy helps the people to see this is where you've been and this is what you need to do as you go in. Moses gives three speeches in chapter 1, verse 6, through chapter 4, verse 43. He reminds them of the history so far. 
He tells them of God's successes and of their failures. He's reminding them of who they are and who God is as they get ready to go into this promised land. In chapter 4, verse 44 through 2619, he gives covenant stipulations. He reminds them the covenant is your agreement between you and God. And this is how you work that out well. He teaches them the way to relate to God. He helps them understand better the covenant through these specific stipulations. And then in 27 verse 1 through 30 verse 20, we see him give the blessings and curses of the covenant. He gave it in Leviticus. He gives it again in Deuteronomy as they're about to enter into the land. These are the three last speeches of Moses. And then we see, after the third speech, the succession of leadership. Moses can't go into the land. He's 120 years old at this point. It's time for him to go home and be with the Lord. And so what happens is we have this succession of leadership. In chapter 31, verse 30 through 32, 47, we see the song of Moses. Moses reminding people in song of how beautiful God is. Some of the most significant summaries of our theology and scripture come in the form of songs. That's why it's important for us to sing to the Lord. After the song of Moses, Moses gives blessings to the tribes in chapter 32, 48 through 33, 29. So we see the song of Moses and the blessings of Moses. And finally, we see the death of Moses, the transferring of leadership from Moses to Joshua, who will lead the people into the land, Moses' death and how faithful he was to God. It's beautiful to read just those 12 verses in 34 and see how he's remembered by the people as a man whose eyes have not dimmed. Yet these 120 years he walked the earth, he's still a man who loves the Lord. So this is where we are. This is the setting of what we're getting ready to talk about in the coming weeks as they enter into the land. But before we do that, I wanted us to take a week and look at the Pentateuch and look at how faithful God has been. So now that we've seen the setting where we're at in Scripture, let's take a look at God's faithfulness through Scripture. <clears throat> Excuse me. We're going to look at God's faithfulness in three ways His protection, His provision, and His promises. We're going to look at God's faithfulness in three ways his protection, his provision, and his promises. So first, let's look at his protection. Going all the way back to the slavery in Egypt, after 400 years of being slaves in Egypt, he hears the cries of his people, and he begins to work. And we see this in Exodus, in the plagues that he sends to the land of Egypt. The plagues serve multiple purposes, as we've already talked about. One is to defeat, if you will, the gods and goddesses of Egypt, showing that Yahweh, our God, is the true God. He's the only one that has power. And another is to bring the people out of this slavery and bondage. He protected Israel even as Egypt was suffering, so much so that we saw in those plagues Egypt saying, Pharaoh, look, there's a massive difference between the two of us. You need to listen to this God because our gods are not serving us well. Now, keep in mind, to even say that risked death because they believed that Pharaoh was a god himself. So God protected his people through the plagues. Then he brought them out in the Exodus. He protected his people through the Exodus, bringing them out of the land after the night of Passover where death passed over the Israelites but killed the firstborn of all who hadn't marked their doorposts. And they come out of the land. And as they come out of their land, uh, even through his grief, Pharaoh changes his mind and begins to pursue them. And God takes them through the Red Sea. But then he doesn't allow the Egyptian army to follow. And so he protects them even in their journey out of slavery. And then throughout Exodus all the way up to Deuteronomy, we see him protecting them from armies. Just a few of them. The Egyptians as they came out and chased them. The Amalekites, which was one of the first, it was the first battle that Israel fought as a nation. He protected them from the Canaanites as they came to the land, from Sihon, from Og, from all these different countries and kings who were trying to conquer them. God protected them and helped them to win. He has protected his people all throughout the history that they have as a nation. 
But he hasn't just protected them, he has provided for them. He's given them provision. How has he provided for them? Well, it starts with them leaving Egypt. As they leave Egypt, they're given all these gold, jewels, and riches from the Egyptians. Now, we know that later on, those very materials are going to be used to build the tabernacle. So he provides those materials so they don't have to find them out in the desert. He takes them out of Egypt and into the desert, which, you know, has a McDonald's every 40 feet, right? No, of course not. They are in a place that has no water and no food, and he gives them water and food. He, they, they arrive at a well, and it's not fit for drinking. So what does he do? He makes that water sweet and allows them to be provided for. Keep in mind, this is over 2 million people. And it didn't say the well ran out after two tribes. Then he gives them manna. He gives them food to sustain them, to help them to eat. Again, he brings water as they move on from a rock. He is providing for them in their very physical needs. But on top of that, now that they've come out of Egypt, now that they've come out from an oppressive government, now that they're two million seemingly random relatives, he gives them structure. He gives them law. He helps them function as a body. As a nation, he helps them to see what are the important things? How do you function day to day? What does it mean to be a part of my people? What does your tribe uh, do? Where does your tribe sit in relation to me? Giving them the law provides for them structure. He also provides for them with their sin. He's a holy God who cannot be in the presence of sin. So he gives them a way to deal with that sin. Through the laws and the sacrifices that he sets up in this tabernacle situation. He helps them to deal with sin, providing them a way out of the condemnation that they deserved. And finally, as we've already said, he gives them all the materials that they need, not just to eat, but to do the things that he's calling them to do. He gave them enough materials to create all of the tabernacle and the, the luxurious, amazing things that are in there that we've already talked about, that as you get closer to God, the more glorious it gets. All those materials that were needed for that tabernacle and all the furniture that's in the tabernacle, God has provided for them. So he's protected them and he's provided for them. But not only that, He's made promises to them. Now, it's not just Israel after Egypt that we see these promises made. We've already talked about this, Genesis 3.15. As soon as they fell, as soon as they entered into that dark pain, the second pain of the painting, we see that God gives them hope in Genesis 3.15. He tells them that one day the reverse will happen. Now that sin has entered the world, one day someone will come to deal with that sin. So he gives them hope. He, he protects Noah as he wipes out the sin that was over the earth. He promises Abraham and his children and land and a blessing. And so these promises have been made all along. And now in Moses, the covenant that he makes with Moses, what we often refer to as the law, is a way for his people to relate to him. He promises to protect us. As I just read in Leviticus as he gave us these blessings. He said, I will protect you. I will love you. I will care for you. He has given us the promise of his covenant. But not just that, because that in and of itself is amazing. But we're a sinful people, and we keep breaking that covenant. And so every time we break that covenant, Israel is renewed with God. He forgives them. He reminds them of his promises. He confirms that he is still their God despite their sin. And he renews that covenant. This is one of the reasons why it's important for us to gather corporately. And so that we together can once again be refreshed each and every Sunday of God's promises to us. We come in knowing we have failed this week. If you came in and thought, I had a pretty good week, I don't think I sinned, we need to talk <laughs> because it's not right. We come in knowing we've sinned. We come in knowing we have failed God. And every Sunday as we worship the Lord, we're also reminded that he loves us. And through confession and repentance, he will draw us back to himself. It was interesting, the discipleship material that we went over this week talked about 
When we sin, what do we do? We confess. And confession is not just praying and saying, God, I'm sorry, turning from that sin, as we've said, repentance is, and walking back towards God. But it's also praying, God, I'm thankful for what you've given me. And let the Holy Spirit rule in my life again. So we ask for forgiveness, and then we remind ourselves immediately that we have an assurance, just like worship. We confess our sins. We read scripture that shows us where Israel has sinned before us and where our hearts are sinful against God. We take some time to pray on our own, confessing of our own sins. We pray as a corporate community as we see modeled in scripture, and then we are immediately assured of God's love, pardon, and forgiveness. Covenant renewal is essential for us as the covenant people. It's a good reminder of the promises God has given us. Brothers and sisters, the gospel is beautiful. We use this word gospel somewhat flippantly sometimes. But the truth is, as we've already said, we're sinners who can't save ourselves. And God is a just God. That means he has to deal with sin. Every single person that's ever been born, except for Jesus, deserves eternal condemnation. We deserve hell. That's where we're headed. And it's only through the grace of God that some of us are called to be his children. He is just and has to pay for our sin, but he's also loving. And he sent Jesus to pay for our sin. It's interesting, I was thinking about this this week. This symbol of the cross that we use in Christianity to remind us of the necessity of the gospel and what God did for us, that is what we deserve. That is where we should be. We deserve hell. We deserve judgment. But instead of us hanging from the cross, instead of us having to pay for our sins, Christ did it for us. So now every time you see a cross, you should think, that's what I deserve. And that's what Christ took from me. By living the life I should have lived and dying willingly on my behalf to pay for my sins. He rose again from the grave, ascended to be with God, where he sits at his right hand, awaiting the time when he'll come back. And when he comes back, we will enter into that fourth frame, that time where we'll be with God for all eternity. We can have these promises that Christ makes to us through his actions, through faith in him. We need to remember that. Even though the covenant that God gave to Moses, the law, is for the Old Testament people and helps us to understand how those sacrifices were to be made, now there's an even better covenant given to us through Christ where we can have all that we need through faith in him. It's really important that we don't forget the gospel. I've been encouraging you over the last handful of weeks to be in the Word, study regularly, be here, because this is where the Holy Spirit transforms you. And as you do that, remind yourself each and every day that the gospel is true, not just for entrance into God's family, but for each and every day. Every day we need to confess. Every day we need to be assured Every day we need to praise, honor, and glorify God. And God showed this pattern early in the Bible with his people of Israel. So God has provided protection for them. God has provided provision, provision for them. And God has provided promises for them, showing he is a faithful God. So now that we've seen the setting... And now that we've seen God's faithfulness through his protection, provision, and promises, let's look at our call to be faithful in response. All throughout the scriptures, we see particularly even up to the point that we've read, we don't even have to go beyond Deuteronomy, the importance of us being faithful. In Exodus 24, verses 3 and 7, we see this co covenant confirmation, and we're reminded to do all that God says. In Exodus 34, verses 11 through 17, during the covenant renewal, we're reminded to beware of idolatry. 
So we're to be faithful through doing all that God says. We're to be faithful through being aware of idolatry and not running to it. In Exodus 34 and 35, we're reminded to observe the Sabbath. We're to be faithful in remembering one day in seven all that God has done, resting in Him, worshiping Him, gathering together to be with Him. In Leviticus 19, we're told to be holy and we're told to love our neighbor. These are ways we show faithfulness to God. And finally, turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 6. You find this on page 151 of the ESV. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, we see the greatest commandment. So we've talked a little bit about this. In the Ten Commandments, we have two tables of the law. One, two, three, and four of the commandments are how man relates to God, and five through ten are how man relates to man. And we saw that Jesus shows us that the first table of the law, that is one, two, three, and four, how man relates to God, takes precedence. And so it's important how we relate to God. And we are reminded of that in chapter 6 of Deuteronomy, where we see the summary of those four verses, love God. Read with me or follow along as I read verses 4 through 9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. As Bill already reminded you, that's a prayer that the Israelites would pray every morning and every evening and even throughout the day. Even to now, a daily reminder that God is our God and he's one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your, our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. <coughs> you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and you shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. It's important that we remember that God is our God. It's important that we remember who he is and how faithful he is. It's important that we remember that we are called to love him first and foremost. I'm talking about the Ten Commandments, R.C. Sproul says, if you understand the first commandment, all, all the other nine are teaching you how to obey the first one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. This is what we're supposed to be doing. Jesus re-emphasized this in his Sermon on the Mount. He, he summarizes both tablets of the law by saying, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Those are the summary of the laws that we are still supposed to be doing. First, love God. He's been faithful to us throughout our history. Then, love others. Show this faithful God to those around you. All of the commands of Scripture, all that we're given to do, every imperative of Scripture comes back to loving God. They're all telling us how to love God, when to love God, where to love God, what ways to love God. Love God because He is faithful. That faithfulness is displayed to the Israelites through his mighty acts in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That faithfulness is displayed to us in his gracious gospel where he shows us the truth of who we are and how we are not enough and that we deserve to be hanging on that cross. And yet he loved us so much that he sent his son to live the life we should have lived, die the death we should have died, raise again from the grave, giving us hope that God is real and our future is promised. And we receive this hope through faith. God was faithful to the Israelites. God was faithful to Adam and Eve. And God is faithful to us. And because God is faithful to us, he calls us to be faithful to him and to love him. So as we leave this first five books of the Bible, where we've spent a lot of time, I realize, 
but we've developed a strong foundation of who God is and what he's done. So that as we leave from here, we won't question God's faithfulness. We won't question God's love. And we'll keep coming back to the ways that he has loved us as we move forward in biblical history. Then and now, we are called to emulate his faithfulness to us by being faithful to him and to love God. Let's pray together. Father, we do pray that you would help us to be faithful. <laughs> Faithfulness, as we've already said, is not something that's valued today, and it's not something that's very often demonstrated. Father, we pray that as we look at your faithfulness to us, as we look at the way that you kept yourself faithful through protecting your people, through providing for your people, and through making promises to your people, that you would help us to remember that those things are still active today. We can still call on your promises. You still provide for us. You provide for us now even better than you did for Israel. While you met their physical needs, you meet our ultimate need through Christ. And you've protected us. So, Father, we pray that as we go out from here, each and every day we would remember God's faithfulness. We would remember your faithfulness. And we would endeavor to be faithful ourselves. Father, help us each to pray every single day. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you most of all for your grace and for Christ. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.